thank you guys. Maybe you tell real quick everybody who does not know Lemon Cat what it is. Um, yes, Lemon Cat is an online marketplace where companies can order catering for business events, meetings, whatever they need food for. And we also uh, recently launched a software as a service for the catering industry um, to allow the caterers to manage their whole business with our software. And before you launched the very successful Lemon Cat, you had quite a bit of uh, other entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ventures that you went on. You're a serial entrepreneur, you had your own things, and you were also more or less part of the co-founding team of Delivery Hero. How did this journey into really wanting to be part of the start of companies come to term? Um, it was actually accidentally, I would say. <laughs> so it was never really my thought, um, hey, I want to be a founder and I go and, um, yes, found a startup or something like that. Um, I'm uh, 37 now, so uh, in that startup area for um, 15 years or so, and um, everything started after I finished school. I was waiting for um, my, my study place. I was uh, actually um, also not studying business, but literature and um, art history, so something completely off topic, and uh, waiting for in my place and just had to work and uh, earn some money to move out um, and find my own apartment, and I um, started as a telesales agent in a U.S. company, very sign uh, was the name, and that was a U.S company startup, Nasdaq listed back then, but they were really one of the old, uh, started in a garage in Mountain View in Silicon Valley uh, kind, of, kind of company. Um, and this is, that was my first touch point um, with the startup industry. And then, yeah, step by step, I, I ended up um, starting my own companies and, uh, and, and sticking to that area. <coughs> was it uh, that excited you about uh, building it up from the ground up? So the first company I, I started was not a tech company, it was an agency when I was uh, 23 and um, I, I was working for that US company for a couple of years and um, I learned how to do sales and how to do marketing and how the US people do sales and marketing is totally different to what European people think um, how sales you know, should, should work. So in Europe we always have the field sales people driving around with their Mercedeses from you know, one appointment to another and in, in the US it's more very very um, structured telesales approach, you know, because the country is so big, you cannot just travel from, from city to city. Uh, and that was what I learned there. So I gained an experience and I thought that experience is valuable and maybe I could start a company and offer that uh, to, other, to other German European companies. And I um, started that agency with a business partner together and um, we worked for blue chip companies, like very big companies like Yahoo, Financial Times, Oporo, and they outsourced their telesales teams or their sales teams to my company. And um, yeah, we were running the teams for them. And, and that, yeah, I think was just because I thought, hey, I'm good at sales. This is what I can, um, what I can do. And um, maybe I can make money and make a company out of it. So it was not really, hey, let's do a tech startup or something like that. And so everything evolved over time. It's also interesting that you went from studying literature to completely going into business and figuring it out on the way. We get a lot of uh, young girls that approach us that don't think they can build a company because they don't know how to code or they have not been to business school. Um, and there's so many examples of incredible founders that did not go to college whatsoever. So how do you f uh, put yourself in this learning uh, moments and how do you push yourself to uh, grow exponentially in that skill set that you need to build up a, a, a startup? So um, I think the good thing about studying literature is that you learn that everything is in the books, so you can learn whatever you want. I mean, there's an even, even nowadays with YouTube and so on, you can learn whatever you want. You just requires the time, you know, you have to invest some time. But um, also, like, if you would have um, met me when I was, I don't know, like 18 or so, I was, I hated math, <laughs> I hated it. Um, I was bad at it too, so I uh, sometimes uh, joke that my math teacher, if he would see me, like, working with all those millions, that he would probably, he couldn't believe it, um, probably. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really, um, if you like to learn something, go and then figure it out. And that's, that's the thing, you can really do it. And um, af now, after 15 years of working with tech startups, I think I could 
I can easily manage a product team as well. I can talk to engineers. I understand what they want to tell me. And um, it's everything I learned on the way through, you know, just talking to people who knew better than I did, learning from them, reading a lot of books, um, just investing a lot of time. So you're part of more or less the founding team of Delivery Hero. You were the CEO there. What were the sort of key <laughs> learnings that you took out of there that helped you then build Lemon Cat and pursue your own things further? The top learnings? Um, Because it's a very, it's one of the biggest startups so far and it grew so fast. It's an incredible team that they build. It's a credible diversity that uh, was incorporated there. So yeah, I'm wondering what you took out of it, out of the whole experience. Uh, I took out of it a lot. I mean, it was really a massive ride um, from 10 employees when I joined to a uh, thousand when I left in 20 different markets. So it was really a massive ride. Um, I think I learned a lot about focus, um, about uh, really nailing it, uh, about how to scale very fast and how to also deploy a lot of money. I think that is also uh, a very important learning because um, when you when you start a company and you know about your your topic um, and invest and you ask investors for money, for them it's also important to to believe in the founding team or in the founders that they can deploy that money. And at Delivery Hero, we raised more than a billion euros uh, in venture capital. And if someone gives you, I don't know, like a hundred million and, and tells you to do something with it, you should be uh, confident enough to deploy it yeah, and, and to hire a team, uh, hit the numbers, hit the goals. Um, so being very numbers driven, being very, um, I mean, being goal orienta orientated is actually what I learned uh, when I was 19 from that US company in sales. It's the first thing you learn, you know, to, to uh, commit on goals and hit the goals as well. Um, but yeah, I think the, the scaling part was uh, the one of the most impressive learnings I got from Delivery Hero. What is something that you could share with us if you were talking to now entrepreneurs that are scaling up, what would you tell them to focus on or look into? Um, it's very hard uh, off topic, you know, because it, I think it, it's um, every advice is always um, important and good enough if you really uh, touch it or if you tie it to really a specific um, question like uh, marketplaces or the foods industry or something like that because whatever I say it can be totally different in a different market but um, I think the way how we approached um, Uh, launching a new a new country, for example, and this is not only what I learned at Delivery Hero, but also what I uh, learned later after Delivery Hero. I was working um, a little bit on the investor side in Silicon Valley, um, investing in U.S. startups and supporting them to come to Europe. So um, I think one thing I I like the most is if you launch to new markets and if you open new countries, um, it's if you have the money, it is always best to have several markets at a time. So, for example, um, we uh, said, okay, we always want to launch four countries. Um, and then you hire the country managers, you hi hire the team in the first place, you have a very strict plan you want to follow from KPIs to business plan to budget, and you hire the team, the country manager, and so on, to make it more of a competitive thing, um, to really give them this momentum of, hey, we now, we four country managers, we're starting our four countries and we a little bit like we are a team, but we're also competing against each other to have this good drive and this very positive drive and momentum. So this is something I, I learned because um, before Delivery Hero, I was um, a part of the founding team and the managing director of Ecomi, which is an online reviews and rating company. And there we had to bootstrap a lot. So I, I experienced both, this bootstrap, not having a lot of money, really chasing investors for money, um, and delivery here, we had a lot of capital. And as a, as a bootstrapping entrepreneur, um, you every euro you really um, think twice, should I spend this euro now or not? Can I afford to hire this executive or not? Um, and uh, that's why you would always think twice, should I open four markets at a time? Or maybe I should only try with one market and see how it, um, how it works. But uh, if you have a lot of money and if scaling and being super fast is the challenge, then um, doing more in, uh, at the same time is, is a good advice. Do you think the experience of uh, bootstrapping a company helped you then be more cautious or more structured when it came to uh, building up 
accompanied where you could go overboard? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I actually think that every founder, especially these days, since um, I think it's pretty, oh, not easy, but it's easier than it has been uh, 10 years ago uh, to get seed funding. It's, it's actually, I, th I would say, it's pretty uh, achievable for most of entrepreneurs to get uh, the first million. So, um, and, and therefore, you see a lot of entrepreneurs as well who are spending the money and throwing team parties and whatever and uh, renting very expensive offices. And they, they kind of lose um, the feeling of, hey, would I spend the money as well if, like that if it would be my own money? And sometimes I'm missing that, especially if uh, I, I do a lot of angel investments as well and I meet with a lot of founding teams and, and try to get an understanding of how the founders think about this. And um, sometimes I have to say that this worries me, for example, as an investor, if I don't have the feeling that people can, that, that people spend the money wisely and that they really treat that seriously, that it's some, someone's money, right? What do you look into startups when you decide on investing? What is your sort of key point of view? It's a lot of gut feel, I have to say. Um, since I'm not a VC, I mean, it's it's really uh, about me liking the the area, um, the the industry, maybe the idea, of course. And then there's, I think, usually most of the investors they they have these three things: team, market, and the product. And um, I think that goes for angel investors as well. So that's uh, do do I like the product? Do I think it it looks very cool? Is it modern? Is the design nice? You know, something like that. Do I really think that people would use it? And then um, do I believe that the team is really top-notch? Could they, could they make it work, uh, whatever happens? Um, I think those questions I try to ask myself before I invest in a startup. So after Delivery Hero, you transitioned into building something on your own again, and uh, it turned into Lemon Cat. Can you maybe tell us the story of how that turned to be? Mm -hmm. um, so I am... Um, before Delivery Hero, I was only working in the B2B field, so I never really did uh, consumer things. So Delivery Hero was the first thing when we really did this TV advertisement and really like going to a very wide range of um, users who could use your product. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a big, um, yeah, I'm super passionate about food and about n uh, nutrition and how to eat well and, and all that kind of stuff. I love cooking. Um, but at Delivery Hero, at some point, um, it was a little bit too, f too much fast food for my taste, you know. So I, after years of having sushi and pizza every day, um, I thought, hmm, maybe it's not really what I want for the rest of my life. And um, so I... I thought, okay, what, what could interest me in the food industry? And uh, since I was the COO there, and um, usually operations uh, is very headcount heavy, and you ha I always had the biggest teams, and whenever I was throwing an event um, or a party or so, and we were ordering catering, I thought that the whole experience was very unseamless, not really smooth. It took us sometimes my, my assistants or the, the event team days to get an offer from a caterer. The whole industry was super offline. No one really knew what is a good caterer and what is a bad caterer and who should we contact or yeah, just like this whole food space was, was very uh, fragmented. And um, and then I, I thought, okay, why why not checking that out and, and seeing what if, if there is something in Europe. And then uh, also after delivery here, when I spend a lot of time in, in uh, the Bay Area and Silicon Valley, uh, I realized that in the US, it's a, it's a totally different scene already in B2B food. Um, in offices, having uh, catered lunches for their employees or breakfast, dinner, and all that kind of stuff. And there, was, there were really some cool companies already around. And um, then I got back to Germany and I was um, doing my homework on the market and I was pretty surprised how massive the market uh, was, how big. It's almost, uh, or it's like almost bigger than the takeaway space for consumers. So it's in, in Germany alone, nine, nine billion. And um, that convinced me to, uh, yeah, to start Lemon Cat. How do you as a founder uh, incorporate your own personal values with the values of your co-founders to create values from the company that really resonate still yourself? Um, I mean, the, the good thing now is I don't have a co-founder, so <laughs> it's only my values in the end. It makes things easier. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, no, but uh, I, what I did was, uh, of course, I think the first half a year, there is... Um, more survival questions you know when you start a company it's not really the first thing you ask yourself hey what kind of values um, 
should I have? But, um, you know, from what I know is whenever people come together and there's a social setting, there are values. If you want it or not, you know, they are there. So it's just a question of um, kind of writing down what is there um, and not kind of making them up because if they are not real anyway and if they are artificial and it's only what everyone wants that the values are but they are not really the values which are being lived in the company, um, it's, it's not a good idea to, to write those down. I, uh, actually, that happened with us at Delivery Hero because it was a very artificial way of putting them together and no one, there were just posters on the wall, so no one really lived those values because they were not really our values. Um, so at LemonCat, I think a year after I, um, I started the company and after I had, I think, like 20 employees or so, we had a workshop together and we had a super cool coach who was guiding us through the process and was really moderating it in a very nice way. And he kind of um, gave us some um, little questions um, and we had to write down, yeah, how do we see Lemon Cat? What is Lemon Cat for us? What do we think is the most visible thing? And um, so we tried to differentiate between um, core values and aspirational values. So um, not having too many, but really two values where we think really this is us. And um, while we were discussing it really in a bigger group of people who, who, are, who have been with us for so long, um, it came like we came to the conclusion that um, the two core values are uh, positive energy and 100% uh, drive. And that was really what we all felt like, yeah, that is in the company. This is like how everyone one works here and how everyone's personality is like. Um, so those are our core values and um, this is also what we do, the culture check and the, the interview when we try to bring people on board to see, do we see those two values in, in the applicants? Do we see that they would uh, live up to those values? And then we bring them on board. What is your leadership style in terms of transmitting these values but also on leading the team but sort of not micromanaging them, I suppose? Yeah, well, I think this is exactly what I mean. Since this is me, you know, it's like if you would probably, if you would ask my family or my closest friends, um, is, uh, do you think Doreen is a very positive person and do you think uh, she has a lot of drive? They would all say, yeah, totally. And that's why I don't, I don't need to do something to, to transport those values because th those are the values of, the, of myself and also of the first people I brought on board. Because if I, you know, it's like if you are just five people in the company anyway, of course, people tend to bring on board, uh, bring on board other people who you like to hang out with. For example, I, I hate it if someone is always negative and always sees the bad thing. So I would have never hired someone in my, like, as a very uh, employee number one or two or whatever, who is always sitting there and moaning about things because that would drive me crazy. And that's why my, my very first team was exactly this. And that's why it is spreading inside the company automatically. Do you consider yourself ambitious? I think so, yes. <laughs> what does it mean for you to be ambitious? Um, I think I, um, I like to strive for the best and I like to achieve a lot and I like to run always very fast and I have a lot of ideas. Um, and I... Yeah, I, I like to create something which is um, very good. You know, if it is um, an email I write to my employees, or if it is an uh, I don't know an, an investor reporting I put together, or if it is uh, a marketing email which goes out to my customers or the website or whatever it is. So I always try to to ask myself, is this the best you can deliver? And this is also what I try to ask my team. You know, when we sit together, and I sometimes I. I think this is not really matching my standards. I try to ask the, the team, guys, is that really the best you can deliver? And if they say yes, then probably it is. But most of the time, you also catch the people saying, no, it's like, okay, but then go and do it again. You know, so like, that's why I think like those things probably make me ambitious. Do you, from like the, you've built incredible teams and worked with both genders. Do you see a difference of how ambition is transmitted from men to the women that you've worked with? 
Um, yes, totally. I mean, I, um, I, I thought about that a lot, like what makes it different to communicate to, uh, to men and to uh, women and so on. Um, I think sometimes ambition is also a hidden thing. Yeah, only because someone is not super loud um, and, and uh, screaming it out uh, doesn't mean that the person is not ambitious. So I had um, a lot of uh, female leaders um, who were very ambitious and who wanted to make a career, but it took me a little bit to kind of get it out of them. Um, I, I can remember that I always had some meetings when I was, let, let's say, I was looking for a team lead um, for my sales team and I had a couple of men and I had this woman and I wanted her to raise her hand and say, yes, I'm, I, I want to take this role. And everyone, like, of course, all the male they and the, all the guys, they raised their hand yeah, who wants to become the team lead and she did not. So I approached her afterwards like, Andrea, but what? why did you not... Uh, tell me that you wanted to get the role and she said yeah but I'm not really sure if I can do that if I'm ready yet if I have enough experience and so on so like my approach is usually I, I try not to ask so much I, I just say yeah you can do it come on we do it together and then I, I just put them in the position <laughs> it's like maybe the better uh, way of doing it throw them into cold water and yeah. then you learn how to swim yeah <laughs> I think that's a good way to do it. <laughs> the first time I did sistership, our CEO came from Paris to do the interviews. And I uh, met with the women beforehand and uh, had coffee and talked about everything. And I mean, this is like my personal heartfelt topic. So I spent so much time just asking questions and asking. So when she came, I couldn't stop myself from being excited about explaining her that thing. And it was 20 minutes before the interview and she just turned to me and said, you know what, you're doing the interviews. <laughs> what? <laughs> but it was the best thing that she'd yeah. ever done. It's like, I was thinking about this a lot with the marble story, but, like my teacher telling me not to play marbles. And it's the best, it was the best situation of th her telling me, hey, you know, you can do it. You can go and play with marbles, just go on stage. <laughs> and it was a really nice moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I agree. I am wondering, where do you draw all the courage from to be able to, you know, go forth without a co-founder, building something in, it is a male-driven environment, building startups. VCs tend to be male. Uh, teams tend to be male-driven. Where do you draw courage from and how do you deal, uh, deal with uh, moments of doubt? Um, I think when I started, I was so young that I did not think about it, which was good, <laughs> you know? So sometimes it's like if you constantly overthink it, um, I think the more doubts you are, um, you are getting. So therefore, I, I never really saw myself as the only female person uh, in the room. Um, I didn't care. Um, and maybe that's, that's also good advice. I mean, of course, we as, as, as the women, we should talk about it and we should really address and, and maybe uh, finger point that there is a problem. But on the other hand, um, we, should, we are all you know, human beings and we want to be successful. So just go and ignore for a little bit this uh, gender topic. And just, um, I, was, I was thinking about also this question earlier about the joke, yeah? What would I do if someone does a joke? I don't know, like maybe I would really love, but only if it's not offensive. But the thing is, um, I mean, why not making a joke? I mean, but I can do a joke about the man as well. I would, o I would also joke about men, you know? So that's the thing. If we are all super, like, where's the fun? If we are all so, oh my God, that was a gender joke. Oh my God, oh my God, May me too, me too, you know? So, I mean, I don't know. Like, I never thought about it. Um, now, I, th I, of course, I think about it more often and I read a lot about it and so on. But um, in fact, I want to do business with the man, right? And it's also not a good thing if there's 80% ma like male leader and I start only spending time with the ladies. Because in fact, it, like, then I have no one to do business with, right? I have no investor to get money from. So I, of course, I have to go into that water and swim with the sharks and maybe... You know, it's it, it requ yeah, it requires a little bit of changing the mindset. And if you said you like to play with the boys when you were li uh, young, why not just enjoying to play with the boys? You know, and do business with the boys instead of constantly complain that it's so hard. You know. So how do you think we could help also men change their mindset? How can we influence that? Um, I think that is definitely something where we need to do something. Um, it's uh, telling the man how we 
communicate. And this is also what I did. I, I remember uh, very good that uh, at Delivery Hero, at some point, I took over the HR part. And then, of course, one thing you do is to analyze, okay, numbers, how many uh, female leaders do we have, what is the percentage, what is the quota, and so on. And then at some point, I, um, had, I had a very good friend, and he was um, also part of the management team there. And he was not having any um, lady in his in his whole team, yeah, it was really like very uh, McKinsey, Excel-driven power team, you know. And I said, look, maybe. And I had a couple of interviews with him together. And I said, look, if you would have interviewed me like that, I would have never applied. Ne like not applied, I would have left the room. Like it's it's offensive. You are way too aggressive. Um, if you want to bring on board a cool. Uh, female, um, whatever, either consultant or, or leader, whatever, you should change the way of how you talk to these ladies. And it's not, um, yeah, it's maybe not the best idea to have a whiteboard task in front of 20 people or something like that, because it is, it, it adds a lot of pressure and it, it's not for every, um, for every woman, this is something we like, you know? So therefore, um, I, I gave him some tips of how to maybe change the interview style a little bit. And then out of a sudden, a couple of months later, he had his first uh, female consultant on board. And that is something where I, where I indeed think, okay, guys, like maybe you can also try to put yourself in our shoes for a moment. And I do the same with my investors. I try to be super honest. I mean, um, I have that whenever I want to raise more money, whenever I w I'm sitting with all of my investors and they, I feel like, we are, are we playing games here? What is this shit with uh, you say this, but in fact you mean something else and so on? And I just try to be super honest. It's like, look, look me in the eyes, you know, how much money do you want to give me? Can we cut this short? And then they understand that maybe I have a different way of um, communicating. And it's also good um, as a female to to tell them this, like maybe we communicate in a different way, but like to be super clear, I mean this yeah? and then see what they say. Make an example. Yeah. Well, we mentioned quite a bit on how we can motivate women to take on leadership positions and leadership roles. How do you motivate women to be entrepreneurs? Um, I, I don't know if I ever did that, if I ever motivated someone um, to, to become an entrepreneur. Um, I think it is maybe a little bit part of, of the DNA of a person. So maybe not everyone wants to be that, uh, be an entrepreneur and start something and, and, um, and go that path. But I would always say do it early. Do not think too much because you can learn everything. Um, I, I would give the same advice to everyone, not only um, female uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, I believe that um, I started very early when I had no lifestyle, no kids, uh, you know, nothing, nothing fancy back then. So I did not have anything to lose. And I think the older you get, the more, of course, of a lifestyle and standard you have, and, and the harder it is then to out of a sudden give up a job, a lifestyle, vacation, a car, and all that kind of stuff. And it's it's a matter of fact that in the beginning, in the early years, it is a tough journey, and uh, you can lose everything, and um, you don't earn so much money. Uh, so therefore, I, I, that's always my advice, start as early as you can. <laughs> that was also my other question. You have a beautiful family and you are, are building a huge company and it, you've never really stopped being part of scaling huge teams. So how do you balance being in this high-paced working environment and actually have a, you know, a home and a family? Um, I think that also changed over the years. Um, probably when I was um, in my early 20s, then of course there were also uh, months when I was working day and night, literally. Um, I, that is something I don't want to do anymore since I have little kids and I want to spend time with them and with the family as well. Um, and I try to have uh, just a more professional and better team, like stuff I did all by myself in the beginning. Now I invest the money in really cool people and in people who can support me um, in, a, in the best possible way that I have the time to also spend evenings uh, with my family. And um, I think I have so much um, knowledge you know, I didn't have 15 years ago, that it's also okay for me to work a bit less and then compensate it uh, hopefully with my, with knowledge and with mistakes. Uh, I don't need to repeat over and over again. So stuff, I just know how that works and I know what took me maybe nine months uh, 
couple of years ago, maybe I can do it in a month today. So um, you also uh, benefit a lot from that. So therefore, uh, I really try to yeah, get enough time for my family as well. I want to ask you the same question I asked uh, Yasmin at the end. If you could go back in time and talk to your 16-year-old self, what would you tell her? Or what advice would you give her? I would uh, probably tell myself uh, to focus earlier really on, um, on well, on creating something, creating a product and doing a company with a product. Since I, the first company I started was an agency and I uh, realized for myself I would no, never do an agency again because it's, uh, it's a super tough business and um, you only work for other people and you make other people successful but you never benefit uh, from it in terms of that your company equity value goes up. Uh, so that, that, I think, is an advice. I could have saved some years uh, there. But um, yeah, other than that, I'm, I'm really uh, super happy with how everything worked out for me. And I think every station in my life was a very positive thing where I gained a lot of experience. So I, there's not really something I would tell myself, like, don't do that or so, because everything was, was fun and um, brought me to where I am today. Do you think it was all fun or it was your mindset putting it into... <laughs> A fun, a fun <laughs> bubble. Or a good that I have a very bad memory and I forget <laughs> about the bad times very quickly, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, it was, of course, it is never only fun, you know. There is very, very tough times uh, as an, if you run a company, of course. But, um, yeah, I think there's, it's still, every tough time is over at some point and then you go back to the office and you are super happy and super motivated again to spend time and work on your product and on your topic. Um, and that's why, yeah, maybe it has, of course, to do with the attitude as well. Thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, who wants to go first? Okay, I'll come to you. Second. Hi, um, I have a question towards you, not as a female entrepreneur, but as a female business angel. Uh, being a female investor myself, I often encounter events and um, other meetups where I'm the only woman in the room. Have you ever encountered a situation where you felt like you're not taken that serious or um, either from a peer investor or from an entrepreneur and choosing you as their investor? Um, actually, no. Um, but that, again, maybe I just ignore whatever I don't like. I don't know. <laughs> but no, seriously, um, I try not to, I don't know, either be too offended if someone is giving me, a, I don't know, a, a mean sentence or it's like a saying no or rejecting me for whatever reason. Um, I think it's, this is also what you learn in sales, you know, that uh, you get 95 no's and maybe five yes, and you can be super happy about the five yeses and you just ignore the 95 no's and you go on and call and uh, approach the customers and so on. Maybe I just ignore that, I don't know, but I think over the years, it I don't really care. Um, if someone is not taking me seriously, I mean, I, tr I yeah, there is probably people who are louder than I was uh, throughout my career, but in the end, I always could convince people by performance. And I think also when I talk to investors or I, like uh, talk to other female entrepreneurs and so on, and we, we talk about, is it really true that women are getting less funding or so on from investors? In the end, I could not see any investor rejecting a successful company. That's the thing. I mean, investors focus on the numbers in the first place. So I would be very, very surprised if you have a kick-ass company and all numbers go up like that and investors will say, no, you are a female, we don't invest in you, right? It's, it's usually then maybe your business model is not right. Maybe your, um, your company is not showing the right numbers, something like that. So I tend to really be super um, objective on it. And then when it comes down to that, it is usually about performance and about... Um, numbers and not so much about personality per se. So I, I try to see it like that. Hi, it's me again. <laughs> uh, first of all, I really love your attitude. It's so inspiring. <laughs> <Thank> I <you>. leave <laughs> breath of fresh air. Um, so given your experience, I'm interested what your advice would be for somebody that is looking to start a family and a company at the same time. Do's and don'ts. 
Um, yes, I mean, if you have a strong supporting network, I think you can definitely make it work. Um, my mom, my both of my parents were also working um, when I was just born, so um, and so did I with my kid. Um, I think it is. It would have been a problem if I would have not had my parents close by, you know, not too far away, or uh, we do have um, a babysitter who can support us. You know, stuff like that definitely helps because otherwise, it is of course a very tough thing. Um, well. Probably it would be better if you can start one before the other, maybe not 100% in parallel. <laughs> um, I could imagine that is a bit complicated with me, for example, when my kid was um, going to Kita when, when she was eight months. Um, and I thought, now finally I can kick off Lamb and Cat, now I can start the company. And um, after a week, then I got a call, uh, uh, yeah, Frau Huber, can you please come to the kindergarten, your kid is sick, and then uh, next week the same, and the week after the same. So that was uh, really giving me a hard time, so it was not as easy just uh, putting the, the kid in, um, in the kita. But um, I think probably half a year later, we were kind of, we grooved in as a family. So we knew what was our routine and who could help us in which case. And of course, then sometimes you just need the, um, yeah, the attitude, the right attitude as a mother also to say my kid comes first and you know what, there is no meeting which is as important as my sick kid and if she's sick, I'm gonna pick her up and then I cancel the meeting. So you know, so like, of course, it's a different mindset once you have kids and you, you must, you know, be there for your kids as well. But it is definitely, Probably you're gonna have a tough year or so. <laughs> Less sleep, or uh, just a little bit of sleep. Um, I just want to first thank you for to both of you because you're both in different fields and very inspiring. Um, I'm obviously much older than probably the most older here, and I wanted to just share in terms of when do you start. I started my first company when I was 40, so the kids were behind me. Mm -hmm. Um, I can tell you that it's not easy, and I want to share that with the others, that if you want to build a company, do it now, and encourage that, because I realize in my um, position that when you get, you're not only a woman, <laughs> but you get older, and you're dealing with two fields that nobody understand, or nobody accept that a woman can f deal in these fields, it makes life even tougher. So uh, at least get rid of the age issue. So I just wanted to encourage that. Yeah, I agree with you. I really agree with you. Also, I have to say that energy, of course, I mean, there's those, there's those two curves, right? There's uh, um, studies about it that energy, the older you get, energy goes down, but experience well, goes up. True. That's not true. Okay. That's not true, okay. But at least you have more experience. But and I would but say it's not true for two reasons. First, you have to do sport every day of your life, number one, and never <laughs> stop. And second, eat properly. So you're both in that, the same That direction. helps, but still, I mean, at least for me, I, I, can cl I can see that there's a difference now with me being 37 when I was, I don't know, like 23 or something, and uh, now having a little kid at home and lack of sleep and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I agree that is all which speaks for start as early as possible if you can. Um, because it's it's not getting easier. <laughs> let's put it that way. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned reading that you can learn a lot of from the books. So, uh, could you please recommend a couple of the books for like for management, which really inspired you or <laughs> which really made a difference for you? Um, yeah. Um, I mean. The thing is, I actually don't like management books so much because I think most of them are, are boring and it repeats the story over and over again, but there are some. Um, so I liked a lot um, the book from the Zappos founders, Delivering Happiness, which gives you a very, very good um, idea of what is the world-class customer service and what customers want to get from you know a company who is very customer service oriented. Um, also gives you a good idea of how the founders started it, how they almost ran out of money and all that kind of stuff. I think that is then in the, in fact, that is the most motivating part of this whole thing. Um, I recently read the book from um, the uh, VP of HR <coughs> from Netflix. Uh, I think it's called Powerful. 
uh, that was also very inspiring if you want to learn more about yeah how to scale big teams and what is right and what you should avoid and how to manage also millennials and all those new trends we we keep hearing from um all the time and uh, there is another book which is more a little bit like a um Yeah, like a workbook, which is called Scaling Up. And uh, Scaling Up gives uh, really managers and entrepreneurs um, like uh, forms. You can really, in the books, you really have great forms you can fill out and fill out with your team, uh, like uh, what KPIs to measure and what is the company strategy, uh, five years, 10 years, and so on. So those books uh, inspired me a lot. There were probably um, many others as well. But... Um, I think there is always from whatever story, you know, even if you read a novel, you can get stuff out of it, you know, how people uh, develop throughout their life and what is their learning and what worked and what did not work. So I think it is not necessarily only about the business part of it, but really about reading, yeah, reading, uh, I read a book about uh, Thomas Edison uh, the, other, um, the other week, and that really inspired me how he was really an inventor, which I'm not, you know, he was really like an engineer and inventing stuff, and how he was absolutely no businessman, and how a lot of stuff he did failed on the business side, but were fantastic uh, innovations on, on a pure engineering side, you know, so like just reading a lot of many different stories, and then making your own, getting your own truth from that. I think that that is something I liked uh, a lot when when it comes to books. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. Um, I have a question, and that relates to like our company. We're just starting a B 2 B company, very bootstrapped, and um, we had the good fortune to have like the first three customers approach us, and now we're at the point of like, how do we start sales? And yeah, this is like a really big question for me. I've come up with all these strategies, but I could kind of need some advice of like how you would start that. And m maybe a little bit just the company or it's about mindfulness for companies. So mindfulness programs for companies. Um, I think I would ask the customers who approached you and who, uh, Yeah, who were your first customers, what they liked about the product and what convinced them the most. Mm -hmm. And then I would um, just go out and try to find similar companies and tell them those arguments and see if you could sell it. I mean, like very, actually, in the end, it's not so much about strategies. In the very early days, it's really about picking up the phone, uh, get in touch with customers and um, convince them. And I think who are like, if not the founders, right, who c whoever could sell the product the best, um, if not you guys, I mean, you build it for a reason, you have the first customers, you are in touch, you understand what, why those customers decided to go for your product. So in the end, it's really kick it off, get some more customers, ask those three customers for referrals, maybe they know other companies who would like the product as well. And then I think it is step by step, and at some point, of course, if you have enough uh, revenue or the like first uh, customer group, then you should definitely hire a sales team as well. Then the question is, can you sell it on the phone? How expensive is it? Um, and then put put a team there and uh, and tell them how to sell it. But I think you must know how to sell it in the first place. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so you're obviously a hugely driven person. And everyone knows that when you found a startup, the first few years are really difficult. And you probably go through these phases of thinking, what am I even doing? Does this even make sense? Do I even believe in this anymore? For like all sorts of different reasons. And I wonder if you like, I think it's really difficult as a super driven person to know when something just isn't right anymore. And you're trying to create like this bring this Frankenstein back to life and it's going to work and we just have to push forward another six months or year or whatever. And where do you get that sense of like, this makes sense and this doesn't make sense anymore? Is that experience or where does that come from? It's a very good question, actually. Um, and I, I don't know if I have the right answer. Um, maybe it is that you just don't ask that question ever, ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think if you start questioning it, like fundamentally, maybe that is a problem already, you know, because I always try to have this, um, 
this picture uh, when I also talk to my team, you know, when they sometimes cannot follow my strategy or they don't know why we're making those uh, decisions. Um, I try to tell them like, look, I know that this is the Mount Everest and we have to go to the summit and it will take years to go there, right? But, and we are not even at base camp one yet. But the thing is that the path is not straight. It's not straight up, unfortunately. So it's sometimes it's like around the corner and maybe you go around the corner and there's a huge stone in the middle of the path. So you have to go around it, you know? So it's like, that is maybe the whole journey of um, starting your own company and really following this path, like following this, this goal of being at the summit at some point, um, never questioning that you want to go to the summit. That's, that's the thing, you know, if you start questioning, do I still want to go to the summit or not? Or is it faster to maybe go back? Then you will maybe never arrive. I think I would, I would not ask myself too many of those questions. Sometimes, of course, like if I, like it happened to me myself, right? Um, but then I th it's also scary if you are very early and you see that summit and you think like, oh my God, that will take decades to go there. And I don't know, can I manage that? then just don't look at the summit anymore and just look down and um, try to do every step after another and just walk. Don't stop. Hi. Uh, can, I, uh, can you also share like, what, was your, what is the most difficult part in the whole founding story? Mm, um, well, there is a lot of difficult uh, things, of course. Um, there is a lot of ups and downs and a lot of questions <laughs> and uh, also doubts and also fear. Um, and there is also times, I, I think what always um, was the most difficult thing for me throughout all the companies, at some point there was the moment when we had to cut cost or decrease spend or lay off people. And that is, uh, I think, still one of the most challenging things for me because it's all people I brought on board because I really love them and I like to work with them and I love their attitude and I love their skill set and for like for various reasons I brought these people on board and then um, to understand and to basically from my mindset go into this other role of okay on a personal level I really like those people and I like to spend time with them and I like to um, hang out with them but I'm also the managing director of the company and I'm solely responsible for survival of this company and also for the money of my own money, investors money and so on. So that is not only a, let's say a social thing, but it's also a resp legal responsibility. And then to go into that role and say, look, we have to make some changes here in the strategy and we have to cut costs or we have to let people go. I think that is always the hardest thing by far. Hi, uh, thank you for your insights. You said uh, you have no co-founders. Uh, so how did you manage uh, the, your doubts in a sense? Did you have a soundboard, kind of soundboard, people who advised you uh, when making decisions? How did you go about those, you know, making decisions that are really important? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, only because I founded the company all by myself doesn't mean that I don't have a management team. So I have a very cool and very knowledgeable uh, management team. And we, um, I have a um, COO, a CPO, um, a head of finance and so on. And we do the uh, decision making together. Of course, some things are my responsibility, like strategy or to really go after that big goal but that's also stuff i um, challenge and discuss with my team and of course i have also a cool set of investors who are supporting me my husband is supporting me as well and uh, we brainstorm and discuss stuff together um, at home and so I, I always have a lot of people who are supporting me and who I can brainstorm with, good friends and so on. But um, yeah, I, I, I just decided this time, I always worked in actually pretty big teams and with a lot of co-founders. This time I just thought I wanna just do it my way and uh, you know have my values and how I wanna um, start the company, how I wanna do the product and all that kind of stuff. So it was a very active decision of not having a co-founder this time. Thanks a lot, guys, for the beautiful question. Thank you so much, Doreen, for coming here and inspiring Thank all you. of us. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Que l'enfant vive. Que l'enfant vive.